Welcome back to Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. We were promised GC Action Deluxe in all of these mountain stages in the third week, and it is delivering. Stage 18 from Odorzo to Val di Zolo, Palafavera, 160k stage, a break from the five hour, six hour rather, marathons yeah. that we've been experiencing, and more of a, I don't know, it's just Long Valley, more of a punchy stage with, apart from the first climb, which is the Paso de la Crosetta. I really want to talk about this start. 30K is flat, basically, including neutral, and then the longest climb of the day, 35 minutes, at 7%, with some steeper sections, and a plateau, and basically three hours, two and a half hours at least, until we hit the next serious climb, which is the Forcella Ciabatta, 10K is 7.5%, but both these climbs are fake news climbs. Now, the Chib Chibiana, I should say it's the correct name, at least once before I, I find it really hard to say Chibiana. So Chibata is comes off rolls off the tongue easier. But this is very much like a a Murder Pagu or a um Marie Blanc. It yep. is five percent for a four Ks at the start, apart from the first case, Steve, and then a wall of ten and a half percent for three Ks. Descent, short little false flat uphill they then they turn and do the koi climb. First two Ks are eight point six percent. They're not easy. But it's on a wider, well-paved road. Then they turn right, and then it's a one-lane road, two Fiat Panda widths, and it's 11% for three Ks, with a 6% the last K or so, or 700 meters. So technical descent, and then a kick uphill, 2.3 Ks, 7%. So it's really, in the last 40 Ks, Benji, a lot of climbing, probably, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 meters elevation gain, and a lot of it's very steep and short. Correct. The thing is, though, the climb at the start also will do some damage on this stage because going into the stage, that K1 battle is ongoing. And knowing that Healy is leading in the K1 battle by like 50 points on the likes of Pino, 20 roughly points on the likes of Rubio and so forth, Healy is destined to try to win the breakaway on this stage because we know that the points on that first climb, on the Paso de la Crosetta, that's 40 points value. And that's the most of any climb throughout today. And I think the only climb that has more in this entire Giro is the Trichime climb, which is the, the Chima Copy, the last climb of tomorrow, which has 50 points. So that will likely go to a, a GC leader, I would expect. So these are the climbs where the k -Wem battle needs to be fought. And we see Healy trying to go in the breakaway on the flat section before the climb starts. And I'm like thinking, there's so many people that will try and go in the breakaway in this stage. Should EF not try to use a Betiol, for example, to try and close down attacks it. until they get to the climb and then have Healy try. So today at the start in break formation, we saw really a battle between directors or the teams that knew how the stage was going to play out Yeah, and EF. And I really feel like maybe it's Healy's decision and he just, you know, excited, whatever, or they let him down because FDJ played a blinder for KOM. They let yeah. Stewart on the flat, he was even pulling with Healy a little bit. Um, they let Stewart and other riders, Millard maybe, push on the flat. And it's 30Ks. It's not just like 5Ks either. Whereas Healy's trying to get in the break in the flat over and over and over and over again. Zana tried maybe once. And it's the guys who tried mm -hmm. on the flat, Haig, Healy, that end up cooked because we hit the base of this climb. It comes back together right at the base. And then everyone's going to do a maximum five-minute effort. And Pino has yep. been sitting in the wheels the whole time. Zana has been sitting in the wheels a little bit more. And so that was just knowing the break is going to form on the climb. And even if you miss a, a ruler five-man break, you can bridge it on a 40-minute climb if you're Thibaut Pino. So I really think FDJ absolutely knocked it out of the park in terms of KOM today. And, and, and Pino got in, Benji. But we also saw Ineos were marking Santi. I really saw Aaronsman always on the wheel of Santiago Butrago. Yeah. Whether that was defensive or whether they were just hoping to get in the move with him, because Santi's got bad legs. So yeah. I I don't know. Was this the day to what what did you see from the GC teams st stepping aside from the KOM battle? Well, you're right with a point there, because we also saw the plus responding to Garfi, and that's actually quite an important moment if we take a yeah. look at this climb because I was deep diving deep into conspiracy theories here because some odd shit was happening when it comes to Yumbo Visma on this climb. At the start of the climb, Yumbo starts spacing hard. And I find that it's pretty hard. Like, 
it was a tempo that probably didn't need to be as hard because at a certain point there was a breakaway that was completely undangerous that was like a bit in front of the group and they still kept on pacing a bit i think it was dennis that was doing the tempo on the climb there and we get to a bit further where we see Garfi making a move because the group has kind of thinned down to 30, 35 riders at that point. Garfi goes on the left side of the road and we see that Roglic and Kuz are not perfectly positioned, like two thirds into the group. And we see one shot later that the GC group is now, let's say, 15 to 20 riders, maybe 22, something like that. And we see Kuz bringing back Roglic 10 meters, 20 meters behind the group. and. There's a few things that could have happened here. One, he could have a bad day. Two, he could be in a bad position, as in he was in the second part of the peloton earlier. Maybe a split happened in front of him, and he had to jump from that group he was in to the GC group again. That's also a possibility. Third option is, do you think he could be riding at a tempo, for example, that he thinks is okay? Well, that card's on the table. I'm not concerned about Hugh Carthy. <laughs> Santiago Butrago, guys in that region, if you're Roglic jumping yeah. in the break at the moment. So the responsibility of Roglic on that climb is not to just sit right at the front and be like, oh, who's going, who's jumping? Yeah. Dude, even if Ineos jumped there, which they did, G moved there, what are you going to do? You got Swift and Puccio behind, Yumbo's domestiques. Yeah. You have two and a half hours of basically valley afterwards. You're going to do a two up time trial with Aronsman and Deplus for three hours before the final is pointless. So, or he was just feeling shit. I don't know. Um, but Possible? Ineos certainly, Ineos saw it and they, they reacted because, yeah, Yumbo, yeah, Yumbo were trying to get a manageable break here. They were trying to get a break of, it seemed, five guys, six guys. Um, they seemed quite happy with the initial break, which was, have we mentioned who the initial break was? Um, no, G, because well, it, it, it had gone yet. up the road at this point. G, <laughs> yeah. Frigo, Pino, Zana, Paripantra, and, and Pronsky. But no, sorry, Pronsky wasn't there yet. Yumbo were happy letting that go. And then there was more jumping and other riders tried to get in and did get in, like Wawa, Pronsky, and uh, Williams never made it, actually, did he? No, he did. He did never made it. He tried at some point to bridge over, but there's already well, two him. Israel riders at the front, so it's not the end of the world for Israel to not have three riders in the break instead of two riders. They've been a fantastic team to watch, though, it is Giro because of their attacking nature. It's a bit unfortunate that it hasn't led to a victory on their end, though, because for the activity that they've done, they've gotten limited reward, I would say. When it comes to Derek G, he's become a fan favorite, though, during this Giro, so that's pretty cool to see, but... The story doesn't end there with Yumbo and Ineos because we go a bit further and we see that Yumbo's back at the front after Roglic has been brought back. And they're riding a slower tempo, visibly. Omen's at the front, tempo slower because groups are coming back, which wasn't happening earlier. The group was splitting up earlier. Yeah. And then I'm thinking, why are they pacing slower now? Maybe it's because this break is now manageable. Maybe it's because no, it a good break. Roglic had a bad day. It, it could be either of the option. We don't know it at this point. Neil starts making move in a, in a moment that is off camera at the start, and then we suddenly see it happening on camera where the plus is pacing with Thomas and Ardensmann, hard pacing, and we go down the group, and I see four UAE riders, and I see two other riders from other teams like Dunbar and so forth, and I see a gap, and I'm like, where's Roglic? And then we see the Yumbo train bringing Roglic back, so it seems like a second occasion where that happens once again on the same climb, and like... When it comes to positioning, I was, I was kind of like, if he's badly positioned to first time around, is he really going to be badly positioned to second time around? I was like thinking that way, but we wouldn't know until the end of the stage if he actually has a bad day or whether he had bad positions or whether he had a certain strategy going into this climb. We don't know at this point. So no answer. Question has been given and the break exists. And the break is, like you said, Pare Panther, Peronsky, who has bridged, Pino, Frigo, G, Bargill, and Zana. And uh, your man Zana's there. How confident were I you when the him. break was formed? Yes, you were. Holy shit. Is that my first one? <laughs> um, spoilers, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, the break has different motivations. So G and Frigo for Israel are going to try to use numbers, I guess. Wawa and I like Bagheel. He's one of my actually favorite riders. But he's there. Really? Yeah, I really like Bagheel. I think he's really underrated. Um, and 
I would give him a, still a decent contract if you were a good team next. Anyway, by the by. Um, Pino is going for both KOM and stages. GC top, top East is gone. Uh, but KOM, he took a big leap foot, a big leap forward uh, because he took 40 points and on the top of this Cat 1 where the break was formed and Healy's not even in the group. So he takes a, it's a 40-point delta. Uh, APP is going for stage. And Pronsky's just hanging on for dear life. Four guys in a Shasper Tat. G kept him behind the whole climb. So that's all the action. And then the race really settles down. So we get to the descent in the valley. Swift and Puccio come back. Affini, whoever, Yumbo get everyone back. Yep. Ackerman comes back before those guys. Ackerman, I reckon Ackerman should just fully commit to being like Ethan Hayter. Like, don't, don't you reckon? Do you reckon he'd win more races? I'm being serious. If he was like, actually, at this point in my career, my top end snap is not with Fabio, yeah. Merlier and co. Why doesn't he just go full lean mode? I'm not saying like, he is already lean, so this might be impossible, and be like a Romandy sprinter. Anyway, food for thought uh, for him. He's won a Giro stage, though. He did, he did. I'm just saying he could, but he hasn't exactly been uh, prolific at UAE. <laughs> <laughs> in True. his contract nor was Christoph <laughs> though so maybe not the best place for sprinters GC is a different story obviously anyway get to the valley and Puccio and Swift basically let the gap out from two minutes three minutes four minutes because I initially thought Ineos are going out all guns blazing I thought they were like oh rog shit we can go for the stage but that didn't really end up happening Benji like it just didn't they let the gap out and out and out and out and I even think their plan from that point on was to just ride, ideally, with Aronsman de Plus around G all the way to the finish, old Sky style. And I'm not saying that's a bad plan, because if you look at this profile on paper, I wouldn't say it suits G more than Roglic, even if Roglic is 95%. Oh, while I agree with your estimations on which rider fits which terrain the most and so forth, I would say because they tried a second time on the first climb to try and put Roglic in trouble because that was that was with precision here. Eh? They must have seen that Roglic was yeah, behind the first time it. around and they launched it to try and see if he would have a weakness there. So from that point on, I thought that they wouldn't ride it to the line, that any else would try something on a climb here, put pressure with a certain rider and see if they see an actual weakness of like, putting Primoz in actual trouble during the stage because at that point Ineos was probably thinking okay is he in trouble or is he not in trouble we don't know yet but maybe they thought that the second dropping of Primoz on that first climb was a confirmation and maybe we'd see that afterwards but hey we're going to continue onwards here for a second the gap is indeed 5.30 to the breakaway now we're heading towards the the Ciabatta as you call it the Forcella Cibiani Cibiana <laughs> even I'm saying it wrong <laughs> And your boy Ackerman indeed starts pacing, then Ulysse started pacing, and Ulysse's pace was basically non-existent. <laughs> no, yeah, it, I was surprised, because I thought one of Ineos or UAE, because all commentary was like, yeah. Rog shit, Rog's got distance on the first climb, and I do think there is a little bit of like, you see a guy drop and lose 20, I'm not, and I listen, I'm not saying Rog is in Vuelta 21 mm -hmm. shape, I doubt he drops on Bondone if he was, but based on him losing 25 seconds, but it, it also wasn't Simon Yates losing 40 minutes. Like there's yeah. some, you know, there's some middle ground that he's not yeah. complete. So maybe he's still that running. Would, yeah, and he's not just oh, he'll just drop from a group of 30 the minute uh, third order domestique starts pacing. Now, uh, were you surprised <laughs> UA didn't take it up? Because he also, you know, moved the race along. I, I don't know. I, I actually didn't know what actually. I, I, I did expect, and this is what ended up happening, I think, on Chibata. Ineos decided we'll use De Plus on the steep part. And I think that's yeah. smart because they don't have Sivakov as well to pace the 8% Ks. They thought, let's use De Plus here, not over his limit, just like a, you know, dropping guys who were like 20th to 25th best climbers in the group yeah the breakaway by the way did anything they just rolled turns right yep until they Chibata. just rolled turns i didn't see much action there they just rolled turns yeah. they wanted to make it to the line i think pino was being quite active because he's also 
getting closer in GC during the stage. I don't know how far he was going into the stage, but he was getting closer and closer to the Malia Rosa to the point where he was suddenly on full, full fifth or so virtually in GC. And knowing that, he's probably like, oh, can I push a bit forward? He's betting on true. two things, eh? That's, he's betting no, that's on true. GC. That's, that was what he was doing. And Israel were being very generous, I thought, because Zana, the reason I picked Zana, by the way, if I see a, a guy getting a breakaway, drop everyone in that breakaway after 5,000 meters climbing, after 4,500 yeah. kilojoules, get in the GC selection of four guys. And then sprint. And, and then sprint. And then pull for actually not just 20 seconds, like a hard pull. Yeah. He's, he's going pretty good. So <laughs> uh, that's why I was like, are they aware of how good Zana is? And maybe they were, Benji. And you, to your point, because, or maybe Israel were just generous because they didn't try anything. Shibana cl uh, climb, they it basically everyone rolls turns. Frigo and G look like they're struggling on the steeper gradients, not surprised. And then on the descent, they're really in trouble. Well, let's do breakaway first and move back to GC. Yeah. Um, the descent, it then forms a group of Aurelian Paripantra, him and his brother are good descenders, Pino, uh, Zana, and Bagi. Bagi, I think, is struggling a little bit on the climb. They, G comes back, doesn't pull because he's waiting for Frigo. Frigo never comes back. And then they get to the steep part of the climb, Benji, and you can see, like, it goes through two lanes, bang, one lane, wall, and uh, Pino kicks it off. Yep, and Pino kicks it off, but it also felt like the typical Pino thing where he, he kind of just keeps going without looking behind him. And I feel like if he had looked behind him, he would see that Zana was looking really fucking good. He was half-wheeling him. <laughs> the rest of the group was dropping one by one. We saw Wadam Bargil and, and G being the last two that held themselves in the wheel of Pino and Zana. And at that point, I was like, if you're Zana, just don't take over. Pino needs to ride for GC. He's going to want to ride for GC. Yeah. And you know that if you don't ride, then he's going to flip out. So you might as well try and benefit from it. In the meanwhile, while was getting in trouble, G's getting in trouble a tiny bit later. He was dropped a bit he earlier and came himself. back and then cracked himself, like you say. And... Then Wawa went over and behind, but they yeah. were out of the race. It was a two-man battle from that point onwards, no? Yeah, and I think when I was watching it live, I also was like, because Zana gave him maybe one pull, like a little, like literally relayed and rolled off. Yeah. And I was like, why isn't he flipping out like he was with Cepeda and Rubio? And I think you're right. He was like, I can move deep into the top 10 here. And also, it's still 13%. Like, if I just ride a hard pace, it's kind of what he should have maybe done with Rubio and Cepeda. Yeah. He can't attack me. I'm not going to lose time to the Peloton. And if I attack and stop, attack and stop, I probably still lose the stage anyway. So I actually, I don't have any problems with the way, the way Pino rode really, because also and I don't think it's so easy to just drop Zana. We didn't know that he basically took every KOM point at this point and is in lead of Malia Az Azura. Eh? So that's also one thing that he's benefiting of next to the fact that he's moving into the, to the top 10. I think he's virtually at this point sixth or fifth, but the Seventh. peloton, well, I oh, mean, sorry. Yeah, virtually yeah, at, this point. at that point in the race, yeah, he was yeah. sixth or fifth, and the peloton still had to speed up, so that would worsen over time, but it was going to be a one-to-one -one sprint on the last climb because they couldn't drop each other. They, I feel like... No, I, I didn't see Zana attack. Yeah, I didn't see Zana attack, and maybe that's because he trusts the sprint. They didn't maybe, show much of them. Maybe that's because he knows that Pino will give him a lead out anyway. Yeah, and that's what happened. Now, we didn't see much of this group, to be honest. I don't really recall seeing them on the descent yeah. at all or the, the early slopes of the final climb. And there's also Category 2 KOM points on this short little punch, which is kind of hilarious. So there is a lot of KOM points available. Bargi's dropped G. Zana sitting in the wheel. Pino leads him out from 500 meters. And Zana is no slouch at all in a sprint. I think he beat... Who did he beat in, uh, oh no, maybe it was him against Tesfazion. They were pretty quick in a small Italian race, Adriatica, Adriatica Ionica last year, where I think he was actually scouted by Jayco when he was on Bardiani. And yeah, he beats Pino easily from this region, I believe, in the Italian Championships jersey, which is actually pretty big. Like, that's got to be, it'll be hard to top this for him as a career highlight. Same time yep. as Pino. Buggy third on 50 seconds, G fourth on 103. Aurelian Paripantra fifth, just ahead of Frigo on the same time. So that's the breakaway. 
done in terms of KOM, Pino goes uh, 63 points ahead of Healy. So huge move for him ahead of Healy. Uh, so even though he didn't win the stage, he moves into seventh on GC and he takes a pretty healthy KOM lead. So that's got to be a pretty, a pretty successful day for Pino. One more thing about the breakaway battle is that I feel like we are glancing over the fact that Zana got some really fucked up long sticky bottles in this stage. I think I counted two or three to the point that it was long actually like too. it was actually like shameful because <laughs> he was on a gap on a certain climb and he went to his car, they gave, gave a hand to the to to the guy, got a beaten or an energy gel or whatever, and got pushed forward entirely to the back of the group to the point that the car almost hit an Israel rider in the process. <laughs> like, sorry, but. Whoever's in that car should get fined or excluded from the race. Because, like, at some point it's a bit too far. I don't think it changed anything about the winner of this stage, but it should not be happening. But I think we're all waiting to talk about the GC battle, so let's get started. Here we go. So we Roglic doesn't move up. He's deep in the field. The order all day has been in GC order. It's been Ineos, UAE with Vine, McNulty, Formolo, Ulysse, Yumbo with uh, Koos, Dennis, Bowman, maybe Hesman Omen, and then Bahrain. Dennis doesn't really move up. He, he moves up a little bit. Ross doesn't follow him. I was like, ooh, what's going on here? In your center of the climb, the steep part of the climb, by the way. I, it's, this climb is in two parts. Like, nothing happened on the first two Ks. Everyone just assumed position. I'm sure it was hard. They turn right. The Plus takes the front, or Aaronsman. I'm like, Ineos? They're just going to ride it to the line. Why wouldn't they? Uh, yeah. Unless someone else cracks badly and they can push harder. All of a sudden, Sepp Koos moves up. Oh. Roglic not immediately in his wheel. I still think if that was their plan, they should have entered the climb in first position because you're spending unnecessary watts to move up there. Like Anyway, but Koos starts... It does, it does surprise people, though, when you do that because they know exactly. it's coming if you do a big lead out into it. And especially after what happened on the first climb, when all the competition is thinking he might be having a bad day. Yeah. Big bluff, huh? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> if it was a bluff himself. <laughs> if it was a bluff, I fell for it 100%. <laughs> but on this climb, we see that move. We see Kaz moving to the front. We see Roglic passing Thomas basically into second position there. Thomas directly on the wheel. Dunbar well settled in position. And I'm looking for my gone. boy. I'm oh, looking for boy. my boy. Arnsman yeah. is up there. Arnsman's like fifth wheel at that point. He was good. But I'm looking for Almeida. And Almeida is like on thin 15 meters initially already with, I think, Vine ahead of him. And he just doesn't I'm respond. pretty sure he didn't try to respond, but it also was like, we know Almeida Almeida's. We know that he's always, if you're in your car and you look into the, the rear mirror, you will see Almeida 10 meters behind you. That's the case on climbs. We didn't see it so far in the Giro. But we saw it for the first time at this point, and because we get so used to the fact that he's not doing it anymore, I was worried for Almeida the second he dropped. But I was really is he worried. not doing it anymore? We haven't had any serious state. Fossombrone, he was yeah. dropped and didn't respond. And then there was no other GC stage for two weeks until Bondone, which is a 50-minute diesel climb, and he was cooking. Yeah. But then... All of a sudden, we got this bang, big acceleration from Koos and Roglic. G, by the way, straight on the wheel of Roglic. Easy. Breathing through the nose, like doing it easy. But, I mean, I knew this could, was a risk with Almeida because, and, and again, I've talked to other riders about this, riders who were with him, in, not, in, not on UAE, by the way, other riders. I talked to other riders who were competing for GC at Catalonia. And... They're like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, you know how Ethan Hayter tries to ride to, or maybe other riders try to ride to smooth power and on a steep climb and come back. But it doesn't make any sense because there's a descent, 2Ks. There's then a shallow section and then there's a 7% climb where they're going to yeah. be going over 30 kph afterwards. And so there's also the last 700 meters of this climb isn't steep. It's 4 5%. It's really fast. And there's a little plateau after that too before the descent proper and i don't i don't know whether he can't surge because almeida practically does i, I would love to see the power data of him and thomas for this yep. for the whole final descent and final he does 
virtually the same watts as Thomas, maybe even more watts than Thomas over the whole final. But because he just releases or doesn't respond to that initial move, he, he puts himself in a bad position. And it's different on a long wall where you can come back right yeah. at the end, like Laporte. But did you think he was in trouble, trouble, Benji, or he was just Almeidering? I think he was in trouble, trouble. I think really? he was in trouble, trouble to the point that I wasn't expecting him to lose a minute. I was expecting him to lose like 10, 20 seconds. And the reason is that this climb is also so short. If this climb is, let's say, 10 kilometers, 9%, I would not be worried if I see Almeida made on, on 10, 15 minutes. Blockhouse or, for example, I would say Paso Jao is more of a climb that, yeah. that could happen, the climb that comes tomorrow. But this is a shorter climb, a steeper climb, and these 19% gradients, I've never felt super confident either when it comes to Almeida on those gradients. And on paper, those gradients fit Ju uh, Primoz Roglic more, which we mentioned yesterday, that we expected a, a Roglic move on Koi at this point in the race. And we see the switch around happening. We see Almeida losing domestique by domestique. Vine, the last domestique that is at by his side and super strong. We'll talk about him a bit more in a second. But at the front, we see that Roglic kind of takes over from Cus because Cus is kind of temporarily done for. Thomas straight up follows the wheel of Roglic. And it's like that for 20 seconds before Cus is back at the front. So, yeah, Cus was you know, going to pace for five minutes or so. It wasn't like a McNulty lead out on Mond mm -hmm. when uh, Micah and McNulty just launched Pog in two minutes. Because if Roglic attacks straight off the Coos pace and he's in the wind, I know it's 11%, Vine is pacing so hard that I think Almeida comes back. Vine had Almeida literally on like four, five, six seconds for a lot of this climb. And, Coos, and yeah, Roglic attacks, he can't distance Thomas at all. And at this point, I was thinking, Thomas could drop Roglic here. If yeah. Koos isn't there, Thomas looks so good. I almost, I think he was even thinking about it. And attacks the best form of dis defense. But then before anything could happen, Dunbar was dropped by the Roglic acceleration. Koos then attacks Dunbar back. They're like, what the fuck? <laughs> Koos, dude. It's, un Gee, it's because... unbelievable on this climb, <laughs> actually insane. Because not even a climb that that's good for him. Yeah. That, that, that is that good for him. And then he just starts pacing Thomas and Roglic again. And I think if Kuz hadn't done that, Almeida comes back properly. 100%. 100%. Because um, Vine was and pacing well, so hard. Vine was doing a God's work for Almeida at this point. They're still on 10, 15 meters, goes to 20 meters, go to 30 meters, and it stays around 30 meters, 40 meters, 50 meters. Around that range, it goes a bit larger, a bit smaller, a bit larger, a bit smaller, and we see that once we get those helicopter shots of the, of the what do you call it again, the dog legs? The hairpins? Is that not the same? Uh, a dog... No, hair... hair Fuck. Yeah. Dog leg is slightly <laughs> different. Maybe, yeah, they're slightly different. Okay. A dog Across leg is separate hairpins? roads, maybe. I don't know. Jesus Christ, this I don't is even speak all, this, all this road vocabulary. Anyway, a hairpin, and we see the gap there, and it stays the same on literally every hairpin that I see, and Vine is doing a really good job, and at a certain point, I thought they were getting closer, a bit more towards they the were. top. And we see that they're coming over the top, and we see that Vine's leading Almeida over the top, and we know that Kuz is a good descender. We know that Roglic is a, a good descender, but... A fast has descender. His, <laughs> can be okay. a fast descender or very okay. very slow <laughs> Dep depends on whether you crash it or not <laughs> yeah exactly you go 70 or zero <laughs> anyway so <laughs> we, we see him not going at zero k an hour this time around he's following because thomas is also in the wheel and i think it was eight seconds at the top of the climb oh and i, I thought, thought it was less I thought it was, was less? less. I swear it was. Ooh. I thought I thought our maid was nearly there because Vine's pushing on a flatter section against Coos. I swear it was small. I might be wrong. I watched it once live, um, and I thought I thought our maid was coming back because Vine on four percent probably pulls pulls a yeah. little bit faster than Coos if if they get down the descent. The problem was the descent, and also Roglic goes in front of Coos on the descent. Very technical hairpins. There's like a. It, doubles back a snake hair figure of eight crazy wave my arms and i was like sep lose the wheel bro i was i was wondering yeah, why actually Kuss wouldn't lose the wheel to roglic i'm sure g would have closed roglic down but 
maybe yeah he's in front of him pushing very very hard and set and he's gapping Kuz almost who's a good descender and then we see the shot vines overrun where it came back on itself didn't crash but i feel like the way roglic went in front of Kuz on the descent i think almeida should have done the descent in front of vine as well, well i think I think Almeida then closed more time on the descent, I swear. And Vine Espe came back to him later. Especially in hindsight, knowing that the Vine thing happened. Basically, yeah. that Vine went wide and basically almost rode into the mountain. Because yeah. that also reduced the speed when it comes to Almeida. And I, I thought they were taking time back on the descent even. Me too. On that portion. I was not expecting that, but they looked to be closer at that point. And Almeida takes over and we get a shot of like 10 seconds later where we see a helicopter shot of Almeida nearly being back with them. So... He dropped Dunbar, who was in his wheel when Vine had his problem. He dropped him in that descent, so I don't want to hear it anymore. Almeida's descending. I don't want to it hear it fine, anymore. It was fine, yeah. Absolute perfection. Okay, maybe not I mean, that not far. But it was fine. It was pretty good. <laughs> it, was, it was fine. <laughs> so he was getting closer, and that is towards a group of three riders, and now we come towards that ramp. Now he comes towards the ramp where you know, and Zana didn't attack each other, but these guys might attack each other. But we see... Thomas and Roglic, and Kuz is still there for the first portion of it. And I'll throw it back to you because you have well, something to say. Well, this is where the way Almeida rode fucks him over. Because okay. now G starts pulling hard. G, uh, maybe even a couple of digs on Roglic. And so despite doing the pretty much exact same what's on the climb as Thomas, despite doing the descent, faster yeah. than, than Thomas with a higher effort. Vine's pulled off because he's done. He came back and pulled a little bit for Almeida after the near crash, and then he was finished. Coos has pulled off, Coos, and it's 7%. I know me and, when I do 7%, it's not so fast. Draft's not important. When these guys <laughs> do 7%, it is important. And now he's basically racing against Rog and Thomas, pulling hard on 7% for five minutes, not his forte. And even if he was, he's just, yeah, that's not the position you want to be in. He needed to be back on the wheel before that climb started. And he wasn't. And unfortunately, we see Rog then take over after Thomas has tried a few times and they cut back to Buggy crossing the line. God, that took so long. Even G and Frigo and Aurelian Parry Pancha crossing the line. We don't know, but I presume Roglic just puts the head down, and that gap, which I swear Almeida was two seconds mm -hmm. or less from Thomas' back wheel at some point in this final, yeah. goes from two seconds, I should look up the stage results, would probably help. To a lot of seconds, my to friend. To 21 seconds on this final climb. And the gap was never over 20 seconds on the hard climb. Yeah. And so, yeah. It was a really, really good work from Roglic. He, there were no bonus seconds on offer. I think he, ha he has no choice but to pull full gas. Probably G was happy to sit in the wheel. And also if G attacked him, there's no bonus seconds for him either. So he pulled a little bit. And then I, I do feel like G did help keep that gap open to Almeida when he saw he was just yeah. behind. I think so as well. I think G did help when it comes to Roglic. I also think that She's probably thinking I need to first eat out the plate of Roglic a bit before I make the move myself to make sure that he's doing most of the work here, which he was. But I believe, like, if we take a look at this, we see them crossing the line, by the way. Roglic ahead of Thomas, Thomas directly in his wheel, and like you say, 21 seconds towards Almeida, and Dunbar not that far behind either. He was, I think, 15 seconds behind Almeida there, so that's 36 seconds, roughly. No. Yeah, 36 seconds roughly behind Primo. So once again, an amazing ride by Dunbar together with Kuz over the line. And figuring all of this out, if you look at the last week, we've had today the weakness of Almeida. We've had yesterday the weakness of Primoz. But there's one man in this, this, in this top three, the dude in the Malaya Rosa, that, had, has, that has had, Jesus Christ, my English, terrible, that has had zero days of trouble, which is Gary and Thomas in this last week. He's the king of consistency right now. And... For the race, it would be good if tomorrow he has a bit of a bad day and they're close together. They're all in like 10 seconds going into the time trial. But so far, he 100% deserves to be in Amalia Rosa because he's at this point the strongest rider in the race. I mean, he didn't even look like dropping the wheel on Tuesday or today. He yeah. looked completely in control. And I think 
okay, you could say, should Yumbo have controlled the stage to go for bonus seconds for Roglic? Maybe. Um, but then maybe that tips their hand. Yeah, but... O other option is, if bonus seconds are there, I'm not so sure G pulls so willingly for Rog to then beat him in the sprint. So maybe he's like, I have to sit on and put another yeah. four seconds into you, which if I was him, I probably would do. Yeah, I would have done that. And so I I'm not sure how much bonus seconds would have changed things. I also think G's not beating Roglic in a 300 meter flat sprint most days of the week either. Yeah, but I also think that this is also kind of the discussion that is hindsight talking from a lot of people. If I look on Twitter, I see some comments about like, Oh, Yumbo should have controlled the race and so forth. Oh, come like, on, everyone thought he was dead. Yeah, like he was, <laughs> he was losing time on the Pras Mountain stage. If you're Yumbo, you're not 100% confident that he's going to finish here as first of the GC riders. Now you are. Afterwards, like the parkour was the best stage of the week for Roglic to have a strike. We said that yesterday, but still the confidence was lacking also at the angles. The way he talked about it this morning was like, oh, we don't know if he has the legs. He doesn't know if he has the legs. We'll see if he has the legs. Like... <laughs> that doesn't sound very confident in my opinion but hey they figured out he has some legs it was, was about percentages confident. last time <laughs> today it's about percentages you were very confident clearly in your boy Zana first of all who oh, yeah, he delivered <laughs> so he can go on a victory tour after this eh? I mean he, was, he wasn't that long odds I don't think um, but maybe we pushed them down with me picking him um, but yeah he <laughs> Uh, I'll get back to Zana and I, I have to give a bit of credit to Jaco in a second. But yeah, GC, mm -hmm. Roglic on 156, as I said, 20, on the same time as Thomas, 21 seconds ahead of Almeida. I think Dunbar kind of, I think if Dunbar rides that climb a little bit differently, and of course Zana won the stage, but say in a theoretical other world, I feel like Z Dunbar could be closer. And I, I, yeah, but does it I admire what he's doing, which is, trying to go with the literal best guys, but it's cost him both in Romandy and oh. I think today. I see what you mean. You're saying as in if he focused on the riders that are around him in GC, he might have gotten more time on them by riding the race differently and focusing on them versus trying to follow the other top GC guys. But I will say he's now off to the stage in fourth in GC on 3.39, yeah. which is like three minutes and four seconds behind the third place Almeida. But Caruso's 12 seconds behind him. Kemna is a minute behind him, roughly, le a bit less than a minute. So we're talking about him being on top of this. And yeah, Dunbar's time trial is, is good. Caruso's time trial is good. Kemna's time trial is good. He's in the prime position for it, but it's still going to be a close battle. So, but he's been the best climber of them, hands down. And By far. I prefer him trying to follow the others than not to, because he's, I haven't, I haven't seen Caruso. Like, <laughs> he, he immediately dropped when Kuh started pacing. And exactly. also, I think Dunbar style, beats yeah? him in the TT. Didn't we say in 2021, 20, I think, Segariala, that Caruso was the kind of rider that purposely dropped calculated, knowing that he could do his own tempo until the line? I think he was just struggling, like, the whole time. Yeah, but I, I mean, think on that podcast, on that, on that episode two years ago, People can go back. They will hear us say that on the Sega Yale episode because it was very noticeable that day. And I feel like he's that kind of rider, Caruso, that does drop calculated. Maybe. Probably. But he didn't come back very much. He lost a minute. <laughs> um, Kamna lost a minute and seven seconds to Roglic and Thomas. Van Wilder's still fighting there. I wonder if he'll go in the break or try and get in the break tomorrow. Aronsman actually came back. Crazy performance from him. He yeah. came back and I think drop, yeah, he dropped Caruso and finished 17 seconds ahead of him. Here's the revised GC. Thomas still in first, still with the same time gap of 29 seconds on Roglic. Almeida is in third, though. He loses uh, his 11 second lead and more. He's now 10 seconds behind Roglic and 39 seconds behind Thomas. Dunbar goes into fourth, now 12 seconds ahead of Caruso in fifth. Kamna loses more time but stays in sixth but only a slender lead of 16 seconds ahead of Pino, who jumps all the way to seventh, four seconds ahead of Lechnesund. And uh, then Aronsman is six seconds behind Lechnesund, 10 seconds behind Pino. Aronsman will easily finish in the top 10, uh, probably even seventh or sixth, or maybe even fifth, actually. Uh, De Plus 
he had to work before Aronsman. He's on still intent on uh, 552. Van Wilder moves up a bit. Carthy had a bad day, lost a lot of time. He's on 921. His top 10 on GC is not looking not looking great. Anything else from this stage, Benji? Still small gaps, it must be said. It's not like a two-minute uh, collapse. Um, but what do exactly. you think? How, what do you think of this? How does this influence tomorrow, for example? When it comes to UAE, we're expecting tomorrow to be a, a very big stage. Eh? Have you spoken about the profile yet, or should I guide us through the profile of tomorrow because it's a big one? Eh? Okay, so tomorrow is a stage we've been looking for. It's a stage I've been looking for. Because uh, this is one of the two queen stages before the race started of the Giro d'Italia. From Longarone to Trecima di Lavaredo. This is where Nibali won decades ago. No, it was this decade still. It's 183 kilometers, so not over 200 kilometers. But the amount of climbing in this race is brutal. We've got the kind of, the kind of start where it's flat at the start, but it starts going higher and higher and higher and higher. Until we basically get 67 kilometers of uphill in the sense that it starts with falls flat and then goes steeper and steeper towards the top of the Paso Campolongo, which is four kilometers at 7%, but in reality, you've been riding a falls flat for 60 kilometers. Then that is basically the start of the climbs. We've got the Passe, uh, Paso Valparolo after that, which is 13.9 kilometers at 5.7%, so also not the steepest climb. So these are kind of the attrition climbs in the parkour, I would say. This is where you would have expected a UAE to have an Ackermann uh, a given space or a Ulisi even based on today's performance by Ulisi. But then the Paso Jao comes around, which is with roughly 50 kilometers to go, the climb starts, 9.8 kilometers, 9.3%. This is a brutal one. We saw this one in the in the Bernal, rainy stage over the Paso Jao to Campo, Nam Campo Cort Nampezzo? Cortin Cortina Nampezzo, yeah. <laughs> close enough. Um, and this is one where, this is kind of the Almeida climb I would have expected before this Giro started. But then we've got a long descent until we're 20 kilometers before the finish line. Cortina d'Ampezzo, where that stage of Bernal, where we didn't see anything finished. Passo Tre Croci starts, eight kilometers, 7.2%. Then a bit of a, I don't know what to call it. It goes down a tiny bit, then goes up a tiny bit, then goes flat a tiny bit. And then we get to starting the final climb, Tre Cime de Lavaredo. And come on, tell me, how steep is it? It's steep, huh? It's really steep. So this is also the this is the biggest fake news climb in the history of fake news climbs. It says <laughs> it's seven point one k at eight percent. It's literally a two k warm up of six percent, an actual descent of a kilometer, and then another warm up k of seven percent before ten and a half percent, fifteen percent, fourteen percent kilometers. That's the whole kilometers are fourteen and fifteen percent. So it's not a 7K, 7.8% climb. It is a very steep ramp. Also, to the finish, to, to 2,300 meters, this is, I think this is very much like last year's stage. They have mm -hmm. put in a really hard attritional stage. It's how long? How many kilometers? 183. There's long, hard climbs before, and then there's this crazy wall to altitude, Padaya was very similar, not as steep. It was but longer, it was 5Ks, 20%. It was about 20 minutes, the Hindley phase. And you can take huge time on a wall like that because Bondoni wasn't even hard. Okay, it was the steep section was 6Ks, 9%. It wasn't to altitude. The yeah. cold climb finishes at 1,600 meters and then it's only 9%. And then the last 3Ks is 3%, 4%. This finishes. Yeah, it's a wall. So, brutal but stage. Last year in Fedaya, we saw that it was basically a really boring stage until we got to Fedaya, where Kovi was already ahead from the break. We ended up winning the stage. And then we saw the, the Ineos space for Carapaz, and Hinley just basically countered them completely and destroyed them with Kemna's super dominant stage. But when I look at this parkour, I, I kind of feel like looking at the parkour, plus looking at the GC, that we're going to get a much better stage. We have to get a much better stage. We can't, that who? was terrible last year. But that's the problem because yesterday and the day before, I would have said UAE feels confident. They're going to take up the stage and they're going to be like, okay, Ackerman, Ulisse, Gibbons, you're going to pace the first two climbs yeah, roughly. At five and a half or something. You can, do, you can do the start of the next one. Um, how many climbs yeah. am I in? So Formula can start. Jao, and then we've got... McNulty, those two can do Jao basically already punching through 
whether you use Vine already there, that's kind of risky, I think. I kind of feel like you need to keep Vine as a, a cust-like role for Roglic. And then we get to Trecroci and, and Trecime, and I feel like then you're basically having the attrition warmed up to actually do something crazy on Trecime and so forth. But are you too scared? you just got dropped way? on a wall this today. Exactly. So... If you're UAE, then are you too scared and will you just sit back? Or will you respond to that by kicking the same stone and going on the wall? Or will you go earlier, knowing that maybe that might benefit Almeida more than waiting for the wall? But you go earlier on Jao, even if you drop Thomas or Roglic, they're coming back. Yeah. There's no and way. They'd, Kus Aronsman are flying. Yeah. So Vine would have to basically do 40Ks, include the whole descent, and then the Trecroci is not that steep. Yeah. And Almeida's having to do more work. I don't... That's a tough ask. And he's only yeah. 40 seconds back. If he, yeah. if, he was three, if he was two and a half minutes back with good legs, you got to go full on jowl. It's not the last mountain stage either, eh? No, This was Saturday. the last stage. They can go all out and try and win this Giro. But they've got a a godforsaken beat of a time trial that comes afterwards, which is the Monte Lusari TT. Very steep time trial, one of the craziest mountains we've seen in a time trial in our lifetime. The craziest, probably. Let's, let's just settle that. It's the craziest yeah. mountain time trial I've ever seen in my goddamn life. And whoever found that is a, set, is a sadistic fuck. But that might put fear into riders in stage 19, in the stage that comes tomorrow. And when I look at other teams, Jumbo Visma, I think they'll feel confident, but they will also mostly feel confident on Trechime, knowing that the steep sections help today. Well, and then Ineos, Benji, if, Just if I was advising, if I was, yeah, would you, if I was Ineos, I actually wouldn't know what to do. Really? Well, would you be happy hmm. with 30 seconds on Roglic for the TT? No, I think but, it's, listen, I'd rather have 30 than zero. True, but I feel like there's no this way like Ineos GC have wins. to take up the race and blow up the race. There's no 100%. way. 100%. Agreed. That's way 100 too risky. Agreed. Ineos to play this relatively defensively. And the, the, the thing I see is that Ineos will, should try and benefit from other teams taking it up, whether it's Yambo or UAE. Let them do it. Let them make the race hard. They're going to attack each other indirectly in the same way that they did the last two days. UAE basically dropped Primoz and Yambo basically dropped Almeida today. So they both have weaknesses on their end. And on both occasions, Thomas was in the wheel. Maybe this is the occasion that he does the exact same thing, but counters. Because if he goes to line with Primos, then it's going to be risky. But if he tries to counter him on the climb itself for a longer effort, then I feel like Thomas has more of a chance to drop Roglic tomorrow. I think so. I think Thomas is going to be looking for just a moment. And as you said, they've been burning themselves through and then he'll go and listen, another 30 seconds is huge for that TT. It's not, it's still not that long a TT. It's not an hour long TT, 30 seconds plus 30 a minute. There's no way he loses the Giro with that lead. So whereas probably with his legs, given that Rog couldn't drop him on the wall today, I G is probably winning this Giro as things stand going into the TT, uh, yeah. especially with Almeida not looking so good on the shorter climb. Um, and especially the, the steeper ones. Exactly. Like, I, I've never seen the man get out of the saddle in my life. Well, we did when he attacked two uh, days true, ago. Yeah, yeah. But fair enough. I wouldn't consider that something he will do in the time trial all the time. So UAE takes it up tomorrow. I don't know. If I was them, I'd probably... But then what if you lose another 30 seconds before the TT? Yeah. That's what people will be thinking. There's <laughs> going to be, have to be decisions made and it's going, to be, it's going to be based on whether the riders have the balls to do it or not. Is Almeida going to be happy podiuming for once and finishing the Giro ones on a podium? True. Knowing that he hasn't been able to do that because of COVID, because of being fourth or something once, being sixth once, if I recall correctly. So... He wants that podium probably. And I feel like Almeida's more likely to play defensive than Roglic will. So I think everybody's going to wait until Trechime. 
So I think this means break wins. This is sounding like a big break will win, oh will my win the God. stage to me. Um, Ooh. Felipe Zana. <laughs> Derek or Pino. G, Gobi style. Pino or Zana, I think. Pino's in the break again. Healy looks tired, not Mate, blaming he's him. he's close, though. P ah, true. He's too close uh, on GC. Is he he's too now close? Yeah, he's in. There's no way Bahrain. There is no way Bahrain, Bahrain and Bora allow him in the break. That or Jaco even. True. They cannot let him in the break. He's only a minute off them. Um, Lechnerson should try and get in the break. Uh, Rubio should try and get in the break. Van Wilde. I'm going to go with uh, where did Van Wilde finish this stage? Pretty good. I'm going with Van Wilde to win the stage from the breakaway. He jumps okay. into the top ten on GC. Okay. I think Rubio will also try the same, like you mentioned. I think Butrago should try and go in the breakaway. I feel he's like he's no been... Legs. He's still 17 in GC, though, so he can't be that terrible either. <laughs> I think Jack Haig has tried a lot, but failed the last few days of getting something out of breakaways. Yeah, he'll go. He failed to get again. into it today. Is this the day where... Let Ooh, is the this break. the day where Let UAE... Exactly, that's what I'm trying really? to get to. I was joking. <laughs> Is this a day where they just put someone in the break when pretend it's a, a consolation prize by winning the stage? Where Almeida just rides on to getting third? I mean, if Vine does get in the break, he will destroy everybody. Uh, he was fucking strong today. Yeah. Uh, should Yumbo let Kuz go in the break? Imagine Kuz in the break, dude. I'm not Kuz versus Vine. He just start right, look behind. Oh, shit, there's no one there anymore. <laughs> He's got a two-minute gap. Just have Kuz versus Vine versus Arden's one in the break. I think Arden's one is getting slapped, but... All right, Ineos, Yumbo, UAE, please let this happen. Uh, that's, a, that's the battle we really want. Yeah. That'd be great. I don't care about GC. I just want Kuz <laughs> versus Vine for the stage. All right, so who you got? I've got, I've got Van Ulde. Oh, my God. I'm go you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stay with my guards. At the start of the Giro, we made it clear that Joao Almeida is going to win this Giro. And I'm, I'm that meme. You did a meme the other week where you were that skeleton guy just sitting there <laughs> waiting for Ineos to change their plan. But now I want someone else to Photoshop me into that green Pepe frog meme that is sniffing copium. <laughs> and I'm going to quadruple down on Almeida winning the stage and the Giro. It's, I don't believe in it. But it's got to happen. So, yeah, it's happening. I mean, to be honest, based on Bondone, why wouldn't he be the best tomorrow? Um, because, well, Steep he dropped finish. today and I've lost complete confidence. Really? You're, oh, really? Damn. I'm a, I'm a very These fragile. Happen in Grand Tours. These I'm, a, I'm a very fragile fan, I'm afraid. But I'm still on the train. I'm still calling him to win. Anyway, the podium is within 40 seconds of each other on GC going into the final. Uh, mountain road stage before the TT on Saturday. It'll be fascinating to see what happens tomorrow. Certainly, it'll be an absolute war and a battle of attrition. Everyone will be jumping to get in the breakaway. Carthy, Haig, Van Wilder, Pino even again. And then we'll see. We'll see how Roglic holds up or whether he's been, he's peaked at the right time, which is for tomorrow. And he's been, he's pulled the wool over everyone's eyes. But I'll tell you what, I mean, people said, you underrate Thomas. I said Thomas would podium the tour last year before yeah. anyone thought he would. Before and he was and then we published an article that said he's doing his best ever numbers and he was like, ah, I'm not. He was. He's literally in his best ever shape. It's crazy. Like the guy could should just keep riding till he's whenever, because yeah, he's his Bondoni performance was crazy good and today he looked like he's doing it easy. So He's the, the most consistent. Yeah, GC and, rider uh, in this race. He's on paper the best rider in this race based on the last three days. Yep. But I'm also like, because he doesn't attack, he doesn't need to attack, but because he doesn't attack, we can't say, okay, he's, he's able to drop everybody. But as long as he drops one rider every day, he's got more time in GC. Well, that's what happened. Almeida, I'm, I'm, Almeida dropped Roglic on Tuesday and G joined in. and. Roglic dropped Almeida today and G came along to the party. Now, I, as a general rule, if you can attack and gain time, then you should and you will. And he didn't on either occasion on Almeida or Roglic. 
He's also very patient, and he's currently in the Malia Rosa, and tomorrow's a big stage. So I'm not saying he couldn't have, and I do actually think he could have dropped Roglic maybe on Koi today. But anyway, he didn't. So he's played it right. We'll see tomorrow how they play it, um, whether they try to... I don't know. We'll see. But By I can't way, wait. Last someone thing. in the chat noted it. Marco in the chat noted it. But Betiol was really strong today. He was. And it wouldn't surprise me if he's in the breakaway tomorrow. He was in the peloton with 25 guys left just yeah. before the final. I was like, what? Where have you been? I know we got that one break. Is he going to do a I mean, EF, you have to get multiple in the break. You cannot have one just a Cepeda. I would pair Cepeda with Betiol or Healy with Betiol. You have to have multiple in like Israel have been doing, even though they didn't really use it to their advantage today. Um, G2 honorable, pulling too much. But, you know, that's what happens when you've got infinite watts. Anyway, can't wait till tomorrow's stage. Hope you enjoyed the recap. And we'll see you with Friday's recap tomorrow. Until then, ciao.